we are life. Good evening and welcome. We are live on the 10th Festival Trust Facebook and YouTube. Thank you very much for joining us on our first deep dives sessions as tonight we explore the history of East India Docks. Um, we are going to explore the, house, the history of East India Docks and we are going to do that with a fabulous lineup of speakers to do that but as always but let me remind you that this this is intended to be a conversation and if you are watching this live please feel free to participate with your comments a question for one of our speakers uh to share your own memories or just to say hi and to let us know from where are you watching us this evening now it's time for me uh, can i ask a question to everybody uh uh, to, to my speakers, for example, is your screen uh, like flashing? Yeah, mine is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it might be my camera, but the problem is that it's only the only camera I've got, so I, okay. I don't have a choice. <laughs> okay, and I, I just want to check what's not my internet connection. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know, Peter, what if you can. Well, let, let's let's see if we can continue like that. Uh, I because you don't have another camera, have you? No, that's right. Okay, um, okay. So, um, so I, I hope I hope at least we don't lose it. The important thing is we have you here, Peter. And talking about Peter, uh, it is now that time that I properly present the speakers of tonight's event. And Peter, let's begin with you. Uh, Peter Stone is a historian, and he is the author of the book "The History of the Heart of London: A Vast Emporium of All Nations." We also have with us tonight Dr. Muhammad Ahmedulla, Secretary of Brick Lane Circle. And we also have tonight with us Dr. Georgie Wemis, Senior Lecturer at the University of East London, Co-Director of the Centre for Research and Migration, Refugees and Belonging. Um, I want now to briefly hear from all of them as a way of introduction so we can better understand who they are, what they do and what their connection with tonight's uh, theme is. So, for example, uh, Peter, the reason you're here today to tell us about the East India Docks is because I believe there's not a lot of people who know as much about the history of any London dock as yourself. So, briefly, uh, to begin and connect it to what we're talking about tonight, uh, how would you describe the importance of the part of London Globally, uh, just looking at the title of your book, A Vast Imperium of All Nations, how important was and is a part of London? Or in other words, what was your motivation to write a book <coughs> about the history of the part of, Lon of the port of London? OK, well, I've been sp studying the, the history of London, um, the whole history of London uh, for some years. And um, as I was doing that, I be be realized more and more how integral the, the Thames and the, the Port of London, the, the wharves and the docks were to London's development as a, as a major city. And it, it became clear to me that London would not have grown into the big city it became mm -hmm. without the Thames and, and, the, and the Port of London. Um, but while I was, I was doing that studying, um, I, I, I referred to many books, but uh, I realized that most of them were, at that time, all of them were out of date. So um, it, um, uh, I thought, well, I, I'll write my own. So, so I did. So, uh, and that's how the, the, the book came about. And then since then, you know, I've got even more involved in things. Um, um, I'm a, a member of the, the Doctrine's History Group. Um, and uh, we, we meet at the, the Doctrine's Museum and um, uh, so, you know, and, and various other things that uh, are involved in the Thames. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Georgie, I'm looking forward to having you with us this evening because I'm very aware of the excellent mm -hmm. and recent talks and work and events that you have done, for example, with a uh, um, um, friend in common and a fellow historian, uh, Asif Shakur. 
about South Asian, South Asian uh, seafarers. And as a way of introduction, tell us briefly about your work and how it links to some of the stories that we will be talking about this evening. Thank you, and thanks so much for inviting me um, on to, onto this. And it's a pleasure to be sharing the panel with Peter and Mohammed Ahmedullah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so although at the moment I work at the University of East London on the Docklands campus, which is, of course, in uh, right on the edge of the um, Royal, da Royal Albert docks, um, before that, I used to work. Um, oh, I haven't seen this picture before. <laughs> um, yeah, before that, I um, I worked in um, Tower Hamlets College, and I've been living in East London since 1983. Um, so I really know, knowing that the area of East London where I was living and working had been the hub of empire, kind of during the 1800s and um, into the 20th century. Um, I was constantly um, amazed at how little the British Empire kind of entered into conversations or awarenesses um, of many of the people who I was um, working with. Um, it certainly wasn't part of the curriculum that was being, te uh, be being taught. Um, and there were various times uh, during the period that I was teaching where it became even more surprising that those um, empire histories and particularly the histories of exploitation and expropriation um, and, and oppression were really not being talked about, not just locally, but, um, but nationally. And um, therefore, I began doing um, work um, uh, I'm, I'm cutting a long story short here, as it's, it's just an introduction, um, around trying to unearth some of those invisible histories because, uh, and part of the result of that is this book that you can see here, which was a result of my um, PhD um, work. Um, and I started trying to unearth some of the histories around particularly the East India <coughs> docks because of the very strong relationship between Tower Hamlets and Bangladesh um, and other parts of South, South Asia. Um, and trying to unearth those histories. And as part of that, I would do um, walks um, with students and then with other members of the public. I did another one for the Thames Festival on Sunday, um, in which we try and uncover those histories and to contextualize the docs so that we're looking at them as part of a um, huge um, global empire and all of that, what that entailed, and linking up with the um, the people who 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 were working on the ships. Um, I met Asif because he came on a walk um, and when he was on the walk around the East India docks he, he approached me and told me that his grandfather had been a seafarer um, at a slightly light, later period than we're mainly talking about today. Um, and since then I've been um, having conversations with Asif in various um, contexts where he has very eloquently talked about his amazing research into his grandfather's life working on the ships um, and landing in Newham in um, 1917 during the First World War. So it's about belonging. So now I'm, I'm one of the co-directors of the Centre for Research on Refugees, Migration and Belonging. And this idea of belonging um, is really important. It's a kind of golden thread running through um, the work that I'm doing about, about empire and the docks. Thank you very much, uh, Georgie. And let's hear now from Dr. Muhammad Ahmedullah. For those not very familiar with your work yet, could you briefly tell us what's the Brick Lane Circle and how does it link with the stories that we will be exploring this evening? Well, you know, Brick Lane Circle grew out of, uh, you know, having tea, coffee, samosas in, in cafes, you know, right? Just, uh, you know, in the in the 1990s and 80s, um, we didn't have much awareness, you know, historical awareness. Um, and then we wanted to do something to try and develop our knowledge base, our intellectual capacities and so on. Um, so about, uh, I don't know, around 2007, we realized that, you know, the largest concentration of Bangladeshi people in this country are in Tower Hamlets. They live in Tower Hamlets. And you know, we walk around, people walk around, they work, uh, they drive, and they engage in you know, cultural and social activities. But, you know, the Bangladeshi community and the local white community and others 
are really oblivious. They don't really know the deep historical links that exist between East London and Bangladesh and Bengal. Um, the 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 connection you know started direct connection started from the 1630s, and the trade between Bengal and <coughs> the British East India Company imports right here, yeah? it was so massive um, compared to other parts of Asia for quite a long time. And then later on, you know, when the British conquered Bengal, the first place in India, they also ruled Bengal, you know, from uh, from uh, from the city of London and places in uh, in East London along the deck docks, you know, where the ships went and ships came and brought goods and took took people. So uh, there are lots of histories, you know, of places and and things in East London um, that has direct links, you know, with Bengal, going back to three four hundred years. So we wanted to uh, you know, develop, generate an interest and develop and, you know, and get people to learn about this history and also learn about the sources of information where they can go and learn. Um, and in the process, you know, over the years, we have produced uh, five big books. I just go through one by one. And, and, and I think, you... and I think on the screen, we have one of your latest projects as well. Yes, I will say a little bit about it in a minute. Can I just show some examples of some books? Uh, yes, briefly, please. Yes, it, uh, is it seen? Can you see it on the screen? Can you see me on the screen? Yeah. yeah. This was the first mm -hmm. one. It was called Plassey's Legacy, produced by uh, eight young people um, in age between, um, I think, 16 to 24. Um, then second one was this one. Uh, this was a fashion recreation project because in a large volume amount of textiles, you know, came from Bengal to this country. Also came from Gujarat, China, you know, some small amount that time, uh, silk, and then Madras. But the bulk of uh, English East India Company imports, you know, into Britain uh, during the first um, half of 18th century that came from Bengal. So we had this recreation project, tried to follow the methods, you know, uh, the process the East India Company used to procure and bring the handwoven textiles here and then produce fashionable items, right? And then, <clears throat> just quickly, um, and this was about uh, the East India Company shipping called From Red Dragon to Nemesis. And it looked at, you know, how the shipping technology and navigation and science uh, developed to enable Britain to become the most powerful, uh, you know, navy and and how they went around uh, conquering and and kind of dominating the sea, you know, and how could a small nation like this go all the way to so many places? So just to look at uh, the ship technology and the ship power. Um, we did another one. This one is about East India Company objects, you know, they brought from different parts of the world. And this was, um, we looked at the objects that are held at Victor and Albert Museum. And again, these are all community projects, you know, and mm -hmm. this was our first uh, historical fiction writing project. So we have 15 people here who wrote, uh, who studied, you know, research on East India Company and wrote fiction. So we experimented with um, using fiction to promote the learning and promotion of history. And Th thank you very much, Mohammed. I, I, yeah, uh, have you got, I'm sure there's a website available for those who want to, uh, hear more about the different projects the, uh, the Brick Lane Circle has produced, including uh, the one I was putting on a, on a screen because I think uh, Dr. Uh, George Wemis was involved in this one as well. And this latest, this latest project you did was, uh, I think, has a lot of links about what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I just noticed a comment from a member of the audience. I, I'm, I always try to be fair to everybody and show as many uh, comments as possible. I think our friends from the uh, Silvertown North Village past and present are watching, so they're kind of like giving us a wave. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. And um, Anna here has uh, asked something that every time I do mm -hmm. an event about the history or the heritage of the dogs, people talk about. Every time I go to a community meeting in the dogs, it's there. And it's a very fair question. Uh, and it's not a question that we this is not perhaps the, the event when we are going to be talking about the answer 
to this question, but I think it's something to bear in mind over the next months as we explore different stories connected to the dogs of the Isle of Dogs, just as we did last year when uh, Thames Festival Trust kindly invited me to host a series of events about the Royal Dogs, we need to think and reflect on, whilst we go on this journey that we are starting today, of what is the future for London's dogs. And we know how much the communities in the dogs suffered when the dogs closed and how difficult and challenging the regeneration process has gone uh, has been for all the people affected people who work there people who live there people who then felt were being priced out of the area so anna i'm very aware of the importance of this question i do apologize if today we're not gonna be answering this question but at the end of every meeting i think we all have this question in mind when we have been talking about the history of the royal dogs as we will be talking tonight about the history of east land east, east india dogs and in the following in the coming months other stories about the area that is now canary wolf uh yeah how how the area has changed and who has been who has benefited from it it, it is something that we are very aware of that is an important question that we sometimes are unable to answer but we are not ignoring the situation the current situation for the communities there so i want to be long story short and i don't think i don't know we may be able to answer this although i'm gonna let uh georgie uh of Magdula and peter to comment on, on the question either now or at the end of the session i'm not ignoring it i'm just apologizing that it is a very difficult question but we are very well aware of the challenges of the regeneration of the london docklands area uh, uh peter uh, georgie uh I don't know if you want to add anything about this at this moment. Just uh, generally what I would say, obviously, you know, it needs to be uh, developed in a way that reflects the changing communities you know, who are coming and living in the area. But also, you know, um, uh, you know, the, somehow, you know, through some educational process or some centers or some learning places or some, some symbols or whatever to uh to enable people to learn you know the complex history because sometimes people put something on and just uh, you know focus on one aspect of history uh, but the docklands area has such a complex history with the rest of the world you know in many different ways over centuries so how can we develop uh, facilities in the docklands that will be a you know a, a facility that people will be able to engage and learn about the complex issue that links the, the document with the whole world. Okay, thank you. Let, we'll, we'll bear that in mind. We'll, I'll, try, I'll, make, I'll try to bear that in mind every time we do a history meeting uh, to reflect a bit on, on that, what has happened after the closure of the dogs and how the regeneration has changed the area and how can communities benefit from that. Uh, now let's deep Let's dive deep into matters in hand this evening, which is the history of the East India Dogs. And how can we understand the East India Dogs without understanding what was the East India Company? And Peter, you are here to give us the historical context of what was the East India Company. Okay. Well, it's a very long and complex history. Um, I mean, the East India Company lasted for, I think, about 260 years. So you can imagine over that kind of period that there was a lot of progress, a lot of change, a lot of evolution that happened. Um, so I'll only just very just summarize in a, in a few sentences, really. Um, so um, in the 15th century, uh, the sea route to Asia was controlled by the Portuguese and the Dutch. So commodities uh, that came from from Asia, such as spices, were very expensive in England. So the East India Company was formed by a group of London's overseas merchants uh, to break into that Portuguese, those Portuguese and Dutch monopolies. Um, their first sailing was from the Thames in 1601. And during the um, 18th century, the East India Company ships, the East India men ships, were some of the largest on the Thames. Um, the company was based in London, but it became the world's largest trading organisation for for decades and decades um, and, um, and eventually grew so big and powerful that it ruled most of what is now India, Pakistan Bangla and Bangladesh with its own army and navy and it was bringing into uh, back into England um, lots of products such as silk and spices and, and various other um, 
uh, commodities, various other uh, materials um, from uh, tea from China and India. Um, and during that time, it sort of changed, it changed Britain. It changed what we were wearing. It changed what we were eating. Um, and also it was bringing in a lot of money uh, because um, Bangladesh, for example, um, was, um, uh, well, Bengal uh, was the one of the wealthiest areas in the world at the time of the, uh, uh, the East India Company first arrived there. Um, but um, the East India Company was really sort of taking that wealth and bringing it back to England for the benefit of the, the, the company shareholders. Um, and in the end, you know, places like Bangladesh ended up as, as, as quite a poor area rather than the, the rich area it had been. Um, so the, um, the company also had uh, trading bases uh, throughout Asia, such as Singapore, and it traded a lot with China as well. Um, in the 19th century, um, the British government took over the governing of India, took it away from the, um, the company and made uh, India uh, part of the British Empire. Um, so, as I say, it's a very long and complicated history. There's a lot to, to say. We could we could talk for hours about the East India Company, but that's just a very very brief overview of the company. And I think we are uh, seeing on a screen seeing on a screen the coat of arms of the East India Company. Yeah. And what was on the site of the East India Docks before they were created? Um. Right. Um, so as the um, East India Company grew uh, in the 17th century, they began to create um, their own uh, ships. So they, uh, they well, they, they first of all, they, they were hiring sort of uh, uh, ships, that, um, uh, um, various ships. But then they began to, as business expanded, they began to, to build their own ships and they created their own dockyard at Blackwall. Um, now, Blackwall was at that time a very isolated area. It was a long way from t from London in those days um, and was an area uh, surrounded by marshes on the on the side of the Thames. Um, so the East India Company were, were building their own ships there. Um, but with the increasingly antagonistic and Puritan parliament uh, that developed into, well, you know, it, we ended up with a civil war. Um, but in the 1630s, the com from the 1630s, the company was facing severe financial problems. Um, and so it's, it uh, ceased to build its own ships. Um, and they sold the yard at Blackwall to a, to a, a shipyard. A century later, that same yard was owned by a shipwright, yard, a shipwright called John Perry. Um, and Perry created a wet dock for, um, uh, for repairing ships. And, uh, and, and he's, ex he's expanded the site to cover eight, eight acres. So Perry's wet dock was one of the very first docks um, on, the, on the Thames. Um, and a noticeable feature, if you, can we go back to that picture that uh, we just saw? Yeah, so, um, so if you, one of the noticeable features of that dock was that, uh, that big building in the center there, which was the, the masting, um, uh, the masting um, building, which is where they sort of uh, fix masts into, uh, in, into ships. And that would have been seen by all the, the ships going up and down the, the Thames. Um, so during Perry's ownership of the dock, it was known as the Brunswick Dock. Uh, and Brunswick was a popular name in the 18th century because um, the Georgian kings of Britain were also the Dukes of Brunswick in, in Germany. Uh, and many of the ships that fought in the wars against France in the late 18th, 18th century were built at Perry's. Um, and, and the dock was also a base for whaling ships uh, with warehouses for storing whalebone and blubber. Something which is not very well known is, these days is that uh, London was quite a big whaling port uh, back in back in the, uh, the 18th century. Um, so, yeah, so that's the um, uh, that's the the. the uh, the area, the dock that eventually became, which we'll go on to later, which we eventually became the East India Dock. Uh, what could you tell us about this picture? I think you sent this one to me, uh, East India Company Alms House Poplar uh, in the 17th century. Okay, Six that, that didn't come from me, but I can, oh, I can tell you about it, but it didn't come from okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. It must, be, it must have been from our uh, uh, friend and coordinator of this project, uh, James King. Uh, sorry about, okay. about that. Right, okay. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> um, no, okay. Well, the, yeah, they, they were. Uh, so the East India Company, you know, of course, it uh, it did various things, but uh, you know, one of the things it built, it did was uh, to build armed houses for its uh, its um, 
uh, it, it's um, captains and and, uh, and merchants and so on. Um, so so Poplar so um, Poplar was very close to the uh, uh, the East India docks, um, and um, in fact they they also had their, they also built in the 1660s I think it was uh, the uh, they also built their own chapel there which is um, Saint Matthias which is is still there it's still um, a lovely little church. Uh, I think it's more of a community centre these days, but uh, very nice uh, church in uh, just off Poplar High Street. Okay. Um, for my next question, I'm going to look for answers from both uh, Peter and Afmagdula. Let's talk about the voyage of the East India Company, the timing, frequency and length of those first uh, trips. And I believe that, for example, um, I got something very interesting that uh, Ahmed Kadula put together for us this evening, uh, which shows the list of the first uh, voyages. Voyage, voyage. Um, uh, who wants to go first? Peter, Ahmed Kadula? Well, let me just give you an overview of, of, of sailing in those days. So back in the days of sailing ships, um, voyages were, were determined by the, um, the weather, um, by wind, of course. Um, and uh, so a return trip to the Far East, so that, that trip we're talking about there, that voyage, a return voyage, uh, would take the best part of a year um, and was made to, and specifically to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to Asia, was made according to the weather in the Indian Ocean that determined when they could, they could sail. Um, and each year, so um, as the East India Company uh, got into its stride, the um, sailings in those days the, um, uh, to Bombay and China departed at various times between December and September, depending on where they were going. Um, and then the ships that returned from India uh, came back at the end of June, and those that came back from China came back in September. And that's all to do with the weather and the winds that uh, were, were pushing along the, uh, the ships. Uh, what, what would you like to add? Well, um, the what, what I did, I had a <clears throat> um, detailed look at, you know, first 12 voyages of East India Company, and I produced a, a table uh, detailing, you know, when they left, when they came back, and the various places that they visited. Now, the first uh, trip, uh, they left Uli, you know, in February, uh, I think it was 13, but uh, they got stuck because there wasn't wind, right? Uh, somewhere down um, down the river. Uh, so it took them uh, several months before they actually had the right wind to sail. Um, and what, what that was really a fascinating voice. It was the first voice, so there's a lot of first encounters, you know. Uh, about 482 people were on board the four ships and the victual ships had supplies. About 100 uh, men died, you know, by the time they got to present-day South Africa from scurvy. So the there were a lot of people dying those days. And even the second voyage, right, you had a lot of people dying after they reached South Africa, you know, from uh, from what they call uh, dysentery, you know, blood flux and things like that. Uh, and this particular voyage, the first one, was incredibly fascinating because it involved um, the English East India Company, you know, pirating two Portuguese ships, stealing a large amount of textiles near Malacca from uh, the second ship that they they pirated. Um, captain of one of the ships died in uh, Madagascar from friendly fire, you know, uh, through mistakes. Um, and then they went to Aceh, you know, which was their main destination. And they spent a lot of money and resources uh, to try and get a trade agreement, you know, from the Sultan of Aceh. But uh, um, they got it, but they realized that Aceh wasn't the right place to trade. So then they established their first base um, in Bantan. English call it Bantam, it's in West Java. And the English uh, headquarter in Asia was uh, in Bantan for 82 years, roughly. They were in between their breaks, uh, but uh, until 1682. Uh, so it was a very important voice. I just want to say another thing. There's an extension of the voyage because when they came back, they left 23 Englishmen in Bantan to develop the settlement. And one of the person who was left for about two and a half years, he wrote a, an account of two and a half years stay you know, in the city of Bantan. 
Uh, it's a really incredible uh, story, you know, from him, uh, the description and uh, and about people, you know, their culture, their food, their habits, and the multicultural nature of Pantan, Chinese, you know, uh, Portuguese, all kinds of people interacting in different ways. Just want to point another thing quickly. Uh -huh. uh, the first boys left village, uh, but uh, for our purpose, you know, East India dogs, the seventh boys left uh, Blackwell. Uh, the Which is the one you have highlighted in red in here. That's right, it was 1611 uh, left, but that was also the first boys that went to the Bay of Bengal, you know, the Indian side on the Coromandel coast and went to Siam um, in a present day Burma, right? Um, and um, and the sixth voyage, uh, which had the which uh, had three ships, and out of the three ships, two were actually the first two built by East India Company in Deptford, um, and one of them was lost, trade increased, and the other one, Capricorn, Peppercorn, actually came back to Blackwood when they came back from Asia. I'm thinking because I'm aware people might not be able to to read uh, all the information on the screen on that <clears throat> amazing uh, compilation of information that you have prepared for this talk. So perhaps what I could do is I could uh, save this as an image and then ping this image as a comment. Uh, because this video, although we're broadcasting live, is going to stay on the Thames Festival Trust Facebook page and YouTube. So uh, anybody who can't watch it live tonight can watch it later on the Facebook page. And what I'm thinking, uh, Af Magdula, if you are happy with me to do that, I can actually, obviously crediting you, ping that photo on the comments so people can go back and, and open it properly and, and have a look at all of the uh, historical dates and figures that you have uh, collated here for us. And now as we move, well, before we move to the um, to the creation of the East India Dog Company and the building of the dogs, uh, let's reflect a bit more on the East India Company wealth at the end of the 18th century. Uh, Dr. Georgie Wemis, what could you tell us about it? I think you've got three pictures you're going to show um, as yeah. I'm talking. I want to check that they're in the right. Yeah, OK, this is the first one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm doing a, a deeper, deeper dive into the, the summary that the wonderful summary that Peter gave a few minutes ago. Um, so, yeah, so, so so Peter spoke a lot about about the trading um, and the importance of the goods, which were important. but. What we must all remember about the East India Company was that it became the ruler of India, um, starting off with the area of Bengal, which um, includes present day Bangladesh and, um, and West Bengal and extends beyond that as well. Um, and to cut a very long story short and to not talk about all of the battles and um, the military um, power um, that eventually resulted in, in this what happened in as shown in this picture so this this is um from 1765 or it's portraying an event in 1765 which was the emperor shah alam um granting in inverted commas robert clive tax collecting powers in bengal so this is this is um absolutely key because um a huge quantities of wealth were made by the east india company um, led by Robert Clive at that time through taxing the people of Bengal. So, um, in fact, um, I'm quoting now from um, Hugh Bowen, who, who wrote a wonderful book called, um, it was called The Business of Empire. Um, and he wrote um, that between 1765 and 1833, the purpose of the East India Company was to provide a means of transferring wealth to Britain. And in 1794, the Governor General said of Sir John Shaw said the Indian Army was the mass which forms the bulwark of, of our power. And by 1833, the East India Company had 500,000 square miles of territory um, with 90, over 93 million British subjects, um, i.e. Indian people. Um, who were paying over 22 million pounds in taxation to the East India Company. And that money from the, that 20 million pound, 22 million pounds of taxation, that was then used in various ways substantially to buy many of these, these goods that were then imported 
um, into London and eventually into the East India docks. Um, a lot of the rest of the money went into um, supporting the armies um, that were taking over, extending the territory the East India Company had in India. Um, so, so there was kind of like profits were being made in two, two ways. Um, this this picture here um, is actually from the, or it used to be in East India House, the headquarters of the East India Company from where India was ruled at the time. It was, um, it's actually called the East Offering Its Riches to Britannia. Um, and it, it, it was painted in 1778. Um, and it was how, obviously, the East India Company wanted to see itself. Again, um, the military power um, and the control that the East India Company had over vast areas of Asia um, are hidden in this as it portrays all of these, these figures representing different parts of the East, literally handing over their wealth to the East India Company. Um, so that picture... Um, pretty much sums up their their own um, view of who they were, um, and and this picture here, I'm I'm zooming through it, is actually um, taken from a document that was showing the value of the imports into the port of London in the year up to 1798, and this is significant because it's it, it it's illustrating um, the the wealth that was coming into the the different um, docks um, just before the docks were built and of course Peter's going to talk about the importance of the um, fortifications that surround the docks which were there of course to preserve the profits of the merchants so so um, the top line in the first one is showing that there were 53 ships coming um, from the East Indies um, their tonnage was totaling um, 41,000 um, tons and you can see there the goods the tea the china the drugs and a whole list of different fabrics as well as peppers and spices that were the coming in and their value of uh, being six and a half million pounds at that time uh, the figures underneath are the are the goods coming in um, from the west indies and um, well, the english settlements of america at that, at that time and you can see there that although there was about half a million pounds more in value that those goods were coming in on 346 different ships um which were only 101,000 tons and that is really significant it's it's adding depth to peter's point about the size of the ships and the huge value of the goods that were on the ships um the other the other figures were showing the exports which were to both parts of the world which were much much less about half um, and also the goods which were being exported, which were not nearly of the same kind of value. So they were, you know, linens and woolens and haberdashery goods and some those those kinds of things. So so that's kind of hopefully setting up um, for Peter um, his his discussion about the significance of the docks themselves when they were opened. And yeah, just, just just to just to add yeah. a, a, to. What George has said, I mean, um, you know, what I think is quite amazing is that, you know, the, how the Indian subcontinent was actually ruled from an office in the city of London. Uh, I think the East India House that you just mentioned there, I think yeah. within Leadenhall Street or one of those yeah. streets. And uh, so it's incredible that uh, a whole continent or this whole continent could be ruled from that one office. Uh, yeah, there it is. There, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I can, I'm, I can do my magic time to time. <laughs> yeah. Um. Can I, can I just add something else, which is incredibly, which is extremely important, and I haven't, we haven't got a chance to really talk about it in detail, but um, the Bengal famine that that took place um in 1769 to 70. Um, which was a direct result of the taxation of the East India Company of the people of Bengal. Um, this resulted in, there's different figures um, which can be discussed, but um, up to 10 million people dying um, in the area of Bengal, which represented possibly one third of the population. So um, this complete, you know, sort of more than decimation of that part of the world had a very, very long lasting effect on 
everything that happened afterwards. Um, we can't possibly do it justice today, but I also don't think that we can, mm -hmm. you know, move in, move on with to about talking about the do docks and the goods being imported without knowing um, that that is the background. The cost of life of that. Yeah. Uh, which also uh, links quite well in, uh, in, I wanted to introduce at this point one another of the stories that we wanted to cover this evening and that's not only the vital contribution of the South Asian, South Asian seafarers but also uh, well let's, 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 let's go back to the basics here because a lot of people are not uh, very familiar with the, with, the, with the word Laskars. Who were the Laskars? Or, or, Do you want to respond? What are we that? talking about when we talk about okay. uh, Laskars? Which Asif, uh, our friend Asif sometimes says, he has mixed feelings about the use of that word. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's derived from a, a Persian word, which is, has got another meaning to do with um, the military. But um, it, it became a, a term of abuse um, eventually in the way that it was used within the Merchant Navy. Um, I don't know how much you want me to talk about it here, but just as an introduction, and, and I think maybe we're going to be talking about it later, is that throughout the time of the East India Company and in different ways and in different numbers, um, people from South Asia, as well as also later on from East Africa and from China, um, were recruited to work on the ships because the crews that left um, London were never the same as the crews that came back for all sorts of reasons and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about their lives later but this is um this is a picture of um, some South Asian seafarers possibly in the East India docks I've seen somewhere um, a date of around 1908 um, for this um, for this picture um, but these are men possibly recruited from Bengal present-day Bangladesh we can talk about that a bit more later as well um, having arrived on a on a ship um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot more to say, but maybe we're not. We're going to go into more detail later. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Akhmagdula, what would you like to add at this point? Um, about about the Lashkars, right? Um, I don't know, you know, when they started to use the name name Lashkar, but uh, people coming back, you know, with East India Company ships from the from the east. Um, from my uh, reading, started from the second voyage of the East India Company. A uh, lot of people died again, you know, uh, from uh, that was from not scurvy, but from uh, dysentery and blood flux, what they called. Um, so they didn't have enough uh, people, you know, when they were coming back from Bantam. So, so from early 1600, people from Asia in small numbers came. Uh, with East India Company ships, not necessarily during every voyage, but I haven't had the chance to look at. Uh, but I know some people came during the second voyage. You can find this information um, by reading various East India Company documents as well. About the Lashkas, right? Uh, they were coming from you know, many places in Asia, um, and they were called Lashkas. Um, I had a look at you know British uh, newspaper on. Uh, British newspaper online, I think it was called, it's called. Uh, sorry, British newspaper archives. And if you type in Lashkars, you get incredible, uh, you know, uh, news reports, you know, from late 1700, 1800 about Lashkars and they're really incredible stories, not some of them. I'll just point out uh, one story. This from the 1838, you know, around 1838, a Lashkar came and then he died and there was a funeral for him by his colleagues. And he was taken along, you know, Cannon Street Road, um, carried uh, on um, several people's shoulder. And then hundreds of local people to come and have a look. The police had to come and keep them, uh, like, um, uh, you know, keep them away, right? So there's no crash and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, when they went to bury that Lashkar, they, had to pay, you know, negotiate a price for the piece of land. Uh, so they're really incredible story. The other thing I would say about the Lashkars, I think uh, Bengali Lashkars coming to East End uh, became very big uh, from the late 1800s, uh, from my understanding. Uh, but before that, um, um, you know, not many Bengalis 
who are part of the Alaska community. I, I got this photo that I, I, um, I don't know if perhaps uh, George, you were you wanted to talk about this photo that you sent me a bit later, but uh, I think chronologically perhaps we can talk about this photo now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Of course. So yes, this is a picture of um, uh, Saint Anne's Church, the Church of Saint Anne's in in Limehouse, um, very close to the East India Docks, and. Um, through the work of the historian Rosina Visram, who've been through many of the archives, um, uncovered uh, this in the parish register. So 5th of October, 1730, John Mahmood, Alaska Indian died at Ratcliffe, Ratcliffe being um, the highway, Ratcliffe Highway, um, known as the, high, as the highway area now. So um, this is one of many examples of um, people who had been um, employed um, from, from South Asia um, as Lashka uh, seafarers who, who died and were buried um, in different parts of, uh, you know, along, along the coast, along the river, north, north and south. Um, the name, who knows what his name was originally, um, but it indicates the sort of Mahmood that he was somebody who was originally had been Muslim. Um, so that's that's just one example. And there are many, many other examples that are, are sort of being found all the time now that there's a much greater interest in finding out these histories. But a particularly interesting one is um, from 1765, when an Indian visitor to Britain wrote in his memoir, um, his translated memoir, he said, the English are not unacquainted with Chatgal and Jahangir Nagur Lashkars. And what he meant, what he was talking about, he was writing for the audience back in back in India. He's writing in, in Persian, I think. Um, Chatgal is present is 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 Chittagong. More people might know it as Chittagong, the most um, the largest port in Bangladesh. And Jahangir Nagur refers is the old name of, of Dhaka. So um, it's just amazing to think that um, that, that there was this idea that English people he thought were quite familiar with with meeting men from South Asia from those particular parts of the world. We are obviously, we're obviously talking about uh, the eighth, eighteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century. But um, I don't know if Peter remember this when we did one of the reminiscence uh, sessions about the royal uh, about the royal dogs. Um, uh, in the Thames Festival uh, last year, um, and we had Asif, and we had Peter, and also we had a, a lady called Colleen Sullivan, who's a member of our Royal Dogs History Club. Uh, she grew up in the dogs, and she was having this beautiful conversation with Asif about the concept Laskas and her memory of that. And if, if now we're talking about the 20th century, so perhaps working con and living conditions for the Laskas were were better and we were talking about different times but uh colleen remembers growing up she was a child when when the royal dogs were operating and ships were arriving a lot of people from all around the world and for her the word nascar uh, lascar was a positive thing because she rem had a, her memory she connected lascars with she said this beautiful bunch of men who arrived with very colorful beautiful uh dresses with their music sometimes they gave us sweets so she had this really nice memory of for her the laskas were these um seamen wearing very colorful and bright uh colors and 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 playing music and being really nice to the children in the streets and everybody was nice to them so it's i just wanted to flag that we had a, a similar conversation and that translated 100 years later, evoked these memories from people who were living in the Royal Dogs. And for them, she said, I was fascinated by them. I was always looking forward to seeing them. It was like an attraction. They were nice and they were smiling. They were playing this, their music and they had exotic um, outfits that they were uh, wearing. So I just... Yeah, and there's 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 material written about the, the men who were around in the 18th century as well. Um, which maybe we haven't got time to talk about now, but I think what we need to do is we need to think about them in relation to how they might be when they're on land and how they might be treated yeah. when they're on the ship, and also the fact that 
they weren't actually allowed to settle. Um, there was a there was a various legislation passed, but significantly the Merchant Shipping Act of um, 1823 uh, that became known as the Lushka Act, and it specifically um, prevented the settlement of South Asian seafarers in the in in the UK, despite the fact that they were British subjects um, um, under the Empire, um, and that gave them. Um, worse conditions than the European seafarers in terms of the pay that they had, the food that they were given, the accommodation that they had, um, and also um, how they were treated. That's a very, very, it's a very, very complex history, but there was also um, many men would try to leave the ships because of mistreatment on the ships or mm -hmm. to move to another ship where they found that, you know, maybe they would be treated better than, than, a, than a different ship. Um, and many stayed and they um, they they set up boarding houses uh, with local women. Rosina Visram has found references to some of the women that they um, ran the boarding houses with people who were known as, for example, um, Calcutta Louise or Mrs. Janu. Um, so I think there's lots of stories to be uncovered and told about the lives in that kind of multicultural part of London during that time, not just of people from South Asia, but from all other parts of the world as well. And it is really shocking to think of how they were treated versus how big their contribution was and how vital the work that they were doing was and how they were not treated equally and unfairly compared to, to their European counterparts. Um, Just uh, very... one thing, can yeah. I add one thing to this? Of course. My understanding is that, um, you know, when we categorize uh, people working on ship at Lashkar, uh, there were different classes of uh, the people who were on the... Uh, there were some people who managed the Lashkars, who kept the Lashkars under control, right? Um, so they probably enjoyed, uh, what well, they did, you know, better conditions, better uh, in, in a situation than the um, than the lower grade of Lashkars, or I don't know mm. what their names were, you know, all mm -hmm. the different grades. You know, there were some Lashkars mm -hmm. who worked uh, in the engine room, and some Lashkars were um, cooks, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and then there were people who were managing the Lashkars, but they were they're from the Indian subcontinent, from Bangladesh, Bengal, and other places. Mm -hmm. We may we, we may have time to come back to, to this later. In the meantime, let's move, let's continue to move chronologically to the uh, next chapter of our journey this evening. Uh, let's go back to Peter. Peter, how and why the East, the East India Docks were created. Okay, in the throughout the 18th century, um, the Thames was becoming very congested with with ships. Um, not only did you have the East India ships uh, coming in, but also the West India ships, uh, which were bringing sugar and rum from the East India from the East Indies, um, you know, there, there was the uh, plantations, the slave plantations in the uh, um, Barbados and Jamaica and places like that. And there was a huge amount of um, sugar coming into uh, into the, um, uh, onto the onto the Thames. So the, the Thames was congested with ships um, and London's ship owners and overseas merchants were unhappy with the length of time it was taking to unload the um, the ships um, due to that congestion uh, because the thing is in those days um, all the imports had to pass through the uh, wharves in the city of London um, for for, um, uh, for customs collection so um, they all had to um, most of them especially the West India ships all moored up in the pool of London and uh, they were you know big congestion and uh, so it took them a long time to unload these ships and um, during that time, there was a lot of theft from the ships while they waited to unload. Um, so um, London's ship owners and merchants decided to create some secure off-river docks where the ships could be lo loaded and unloaded. The, the original investors in that, that, uh, that what was going to be the first dock um, actually separated into two groups, two groups, and then they formed two sets of docks, uh, which were firstly the West India docks at the north and northern end of the Isle of Dogs, uh, which was for ships trading with the West Indies, and that opened in 1802. 
and then the London docks, which were at Wapping, which were created by London's general overseas merchants and ship owners dealing in tobacco and other cargoes. And that those docks opened in 1805. So we now have two sets of docks on the Thames. Um, and these docks were surrounded by warehouses where the goods could be stored uh, while they waited to be sent out or to arrive. Um, and um, the for security, the these docks, the two docks, um, were surrounded by high walls. Um, so after the uh, West India ships moved into their dock in 1802, the river pirates who had been stealing uh, from the, the ships turned their attention to the ships of the East India Company. Um, so the, those merchants, uh, the East India merchants and ship owners, decided to create their docks, their own docks, um, for the, the, the ships trading with the, the Far East. And that proposal actually came from a group of ship owners uh, led by two men, Robert Wigram and John Warmore, rather than the East India Company itself. Um, and in July 1803, an Act of Parliament was passed to create the East India Docks. Um, and it gave this Act of Parliament gave the, these new docks a 21 year monopoly on any goods arriving from the Far East, uh, which effectively made the docks exclusive to the, the East India Company. Um, the East India Company uh, the East India Dock Company was formed to undertake the scheme and the initial of, an, an initial offering of £200,000 of shares was issued um, and they were mostly purchased by the East India uh, merchants and, and shipbuilders. Um, so the uh, this new dock company, East India Dock Company, it purchased back the Brunswick Dock, which I'd mentioned earlier, at Blackhawk. Uh, which had been sold by the East India Company 100, 150 years earlier. Um, and they also bought several plots of land uh, in the marshes um, and, um, and elsewhere that, that surrounded the, uh, um, the, 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 Black, the, um, the, the Brunswick dock at Blackwall. Um, and so the, 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 this planned dock that they were, they, this dock they planned was, was actually quite small compared with the, the West India docks because the, as I've mentioned earlier, the, the, the sailings of East India company ships were fa fairly spread out throughout the year, whereas those of the West India trade all departed and arrived at the same time. Um, so, um, and then the, the East India, uh, the investors of the East India docks took advantage of the experience gained during the building of the previous two sets of docks, the West India and the London docks, and they hired um, two very experienced men, John Rennie and Ralph Walker, who between them had worked on the, the West India and the London docks. And they commissioned them to carry out the expansion of the Brunswick dock to form the East India dock. So Rennie's, Rennie Walker's plan consisted of three basins. Uh, and in fact, you can see them there on the screen at the moment. So you, on that map at the moment, you can see this sort of snake-like uh, the, the Bow Creek coming down. And just to the, the uh, left of Bow Creek, to the west of Bow Creek, there's the East India docks. Um, so um, the, uh, at the bottom of those three basins was the, um, uh, the what was called the export dock. Um, so that ships going going out with exports, and that actually was they they taken the Brunswick dock and they'd um, reconfigured it to become the the export dock of the East India docks, and then to the north of that above that um, they created this bigger dock which was the uh, the import dock, and that's where all the um, uh, spices and silks and so on came in um, that were being brought in from the Far East, um, but then they realised that um, they needed to sort of the ships needed to move around within these docks so therefore they they created this smaller dock which you can just see to the uh to the right of the two main docks uh, and that was the the entrance basin and off of the entrance basin you've got a a lock uh, going out onto the onto the thames um so the east india ships were the the largest ships apart from the naval ships the east india ships were the largest ships on the thames so the entrance lock from the river on, on into the basin was uh, was built very wide for its time for 48 feet wide uh, to allow for the entry of the the largest of these east india men east india men shop ships the so it's the largest of any of the docks at that time um the scheme itself required 18 million bricks um, which was quite challenging considering that the uh, location of the docks was was quite remote um, in those days. Um, some of those bricks were produced on site from brick earth excavated from the import dock um, and um, others were uh, produced further up river at Brentford. 
Um, the, the docks were connected by road as well. A new road was built um, simultaneously with the creation of the docks. Um, and that was actually created by the chairman of the, the West India docks. Um, so you had this, this long road coming out of London, which was the commercial road, uh, which then became the East India East India Dock Road, uh, which linked the the um, East India Docks to to the city of London, um, and then and they're actually they're on the screen right now. Um, you see on the left hand side, you see this big gate. Um, and this is such was... an iconic iconic building. Every time I have Google East India Dock in preparation for tonight in the last days, a, an image of this building of this uh, gate always comes up. Exactly, and that became um, a very familiar sight in in East London. Um, and that was in the um, the uh, northwest corner of the the uh, import dock, leading out onto um, East India Dock Road. In that particular photo, that's that's that photo is from the the nineteenth uh, 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 later in the nineteenth century. Because um, to just to place it for anyone, uh, the building on the right hand side that looks like a bit like a Scottish castle. Um, that's actually the entrance to the Blackwall Tunnel. So uh, when this photo was taken. Um, much later than the the building of the docks, the um, the Blackwall Tunnel entrance was right beside the uh, uh, the the entrance into the, the East India docks, uh, and that um, that gate was seventy feet high. So it, as I say, we became a very prominent local landmark. Um, so the East India docks were opened with a grand ceremony in, in August eighteen o six, and just to add that, so um, I don't know if you can go back to to one of the maps. Is that possible? The uh, uh, well, this, uh, this one. Uh, or no, the other one? can you go back to the previous one. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So um, as you see the, the sort of snaking uh, Bow Creek, um, uh -huh. so you can see um, on the um, the west side of Bow Creek, so between the East, the East India Docks and Bow Creek itself, you see lots of buildings. And um, that was um, uh, a, a small hamlet which um, uh, called... Um, Orchard, Orchard, Orchard House, it was called. It was based on an old house that used to be there. And um, Orchard House... You can see it's kind of really cut off from the rest of London by the creation of the East India Docks. And so Orchard House became a very isolated um, hamlet um, in, in, in East London. Uh, it's quite separate from, from the rest of East London because of the um, because it was cut off by the, um, uh, the East India Docks. Um, so um, from the. Um, yeah, so the, uh, where shall I go now? So, so um, the, yeah, so the, the East India docks were, um, uh, the East India company, um, during the big time before the East India docks, the, um, uh, because um, uh, goods had to be brought up into the city of London for customs purposes, um, the, um, the East India company had created its own um uh, warehouses in the city of London where they stored their very valuable spices, silks and so on. Um, and uh, those were um, around a, a street called Cutler Street, um, which is just off just to the um, just off Bishopsgate. Um, and uh, and so therefore the um, uh, the um, when the East India docks were built, they um, there was no need to surround the docks with the um, uh, uh, with um, uh, with warehouses as there were at the West India and the um, at the London docks because the uh, they already had the warehouses in in the East End. And actually, just to mention a, a personal point on the those warehouses that cut the streets um, in the in the nineteen forties, um, my mother and father were working in those warehouses. They still exist now, and my mother and father <laughs> were working there, and that's where they started courting. That's where they met and started courting. So I have a personal collection with the, the East India dock. <laughs> the uh, um, warehouses that cut the street. Um, so, so yeah. So the so there was very very little initially. There was very little warehousing around the um, East India docks when they were first built. Uh, although over, over over time they they did add uh, various warehouses around them. Um, so um, yeah. So I think that's that gives you a kind of quick overview of of the, the creation of the uh, um, East India docks. And Peter, I want to say uh, Robert Rogers, who used to be the secretary of the, uh, well, uh, one of the committee members of the Newham History Society, he is reading your book. Uh, 
the history of the port of London. And I know it's true because I've been to his house recently and that's the first thing I spotted. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's watching us this evening. And he also left a comment that I want to show now in case I forget later. <laughs> and he says, I was baptized at San, Ma San Matias Church. Sorry, in, in Spanish is Matias. I'm sure I have completely, mm. totally mispronounced. I was baptized at San Matias Church at Popla. Uh, in 1953, which was an East Indian church. I was told that all male children christened there were made freemen of the East India Company, but never ever been able to find on facts on the subject. So uh, since I've got you here, no. uh, can any of you reply to uh, Robert's question? No, I, I know the church, but I, I don't know that much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't I don't know about that either. I mean, the church is amazing. And I think we should give a big shout out to sisters Christine and her team who've been running food banks there and all sorts of local community activities. They also have done quite a lot of research into the history of the church. So I'd, I'd say to to Robert Rogers that if you haven't already done so to to contact um, the project based there and uh, see if you can find out more. And we also have a question from uh, Jennifer McCullough. McCullough. Uh, is it my imagination or is that still part of the entrance of the Black Wall Tunnel? I was wondering if she's talking about uh, this building. Right. No, that, um, that, the, the building on the, the right that looks like the Scottish Castle, that, that was the entrance to the, the Black Wall Tunnel. Um, I don't know if it actually it was the entrance or the exit. Um, but I've got a feeling that, that I'm pretty sure that building is gone. The, there's still the the the, um, uh, the sister of that at the other end of the, yeah. the Blackwall Tunnel on the south side, but um, the the north side I think has been completely rebuilt, and that that particular uh, building is gone. I was actually very happy that Jennifer asked the question because I was wondering the same. Like that, um, the building the building on the right reminded me of the entrance to the tunnel. So I was thinking, oh, that's very well a spot, Jennifer. Yeah. I had exact same question. Yeah. No, that that whole area has been completely redeveloped, and it's now you know really sort of a, a huge road junction. And uh, I've got another question from uh, Susan. And well, it's a comment, and she's talking about my dad has always spoken about how busy the Cutler Street warehouse was. He was a lighterman on the Thames many years ago. By the way, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Robert, and thank you, Jennifer, for being part of today's conversation. I had actually a photo about Cutler Street. I was going to show it a bit later in the conversation, but since uh, Susan is talking about it, let's have a look at it now, uh, if I can find it. Uh, Peter, you sent me this, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Should so, we talk yeah. about this now, since uh, Susan has kindly joined the conversation? Well, um, unless um, the others have got anything to add, I mean, the um, you can still see. I think it's the on the picture on the left. I think you can still see more or less that same gateway um, looking into the Cutler Street warehouse now. Um, it's, it's a sort of quite a large complex of warehouses. You can walk around inside. It's it's now uh, it's been re, rebuilt as or it's been changed into offices and there's sort of modern buildings within the, the complex. Um, but uh, it's still quite quite a, a nice place to wander around, I think, you know, and quite historic. Um, so uh, and you, you can still you can certainly still recognize it. So um, just to just to place it for anyone who wants to go there, if you come out of Liverpool Street Station and go uh, up the escalators onto the Bishopsgate side, you go straight across the Bishopsgate, cross over Bishopsgate, and in front of you, you've got a, a small street called New Street. You walk down New Street and straight away you're into buildings that were part of this complex. And, and then you go through an archway into what we can see there um, in, in, in the pictures. And uh, moving on chronologically on our, on our journey today, I think my the first step is after the East India Docks monopoly on trade with the Far East ended. With the Far East ended, the merger with the West India Dock the West India Dock Company, Peter. Yeah. So in in the in the early years, the East India Docks were were quite profitable. Um, 
but the the docks monopoly so I, I mentioned earlier that they had a 21 year monopoly on on trade with the far east um, but that ended in 1827 um, so to protect them the uh, from the resulting competition once the the business was opened up um, the the east india company paid the dock company an annual fee um, for the use of the docks but then in the early 1830s the East India Company itself has such as, uh, suffered a financial crisis because their monopoly with India had actually ended in 1813 and their, India, their monopoly with China ended in 1833. Um, so their business was, was blown wide open to, to anyone. Um, and furthermore, the, the St. Catherine's docks opened in 1828 around that time. So um, so now there was an, a new riverside water being created that would could offer lower landing rates than any of these docks. Um, so therefore, um, you then had overcapacity for the berthing of ships and for the um, uh, storing of, of goods in warehouses. So and the business, the whole business on, the, on between all the docks became very, very competitive. Um, so, and, and with the financial crisis at the East India Company, the dock company, um, which was, of course was a separate company, was also deprived of its use of the, the, the East India Company warehouses in, in the city. Um, but the, the problem for the East India docks was that they'd been created with minimal warehousing from which they could, they could profit in this new open competitive market. But on the other hand, uh, with the opening of the St. Catharines and the walls, the West India docks had too much warehousing. So therefore, it made sense for the East and West India docks, the, the two dock companies, to merge, which they did in 1838. And there are, thereafter, the two sets of docks no longer specialised in, in trade with the West India or the East India, uh, or West Indies and East Indies, but they, ha they therefore, after that, handled general merchandise from wh whatever its, its origin. Um, but the, the East India docks itself, themselves were, were quite, still remained quite busy because they're, as I said earlier, they're, they had a wide entrance lock, wider than the, um, the West India docks, and that suited them for the larger ships of the time. Um, so they became, they remained quite busy. Um, and um, they, they tended to specialise in, in certain cargoes. So jute and seed were initially special, or specialities at that time uh, from a period in, in the mid 19th centuries. Um, and they also handled the um, import and storage of guano, which was used as a fertilizer. Um, and by the 1880s, the East India docks were dealing in rice, in jute, seed, wheat, wool and tallow, as well as frozen meat from the Falkland Islands. Um, and ships were arriving from as far away as Australia and other colonies and from, from America. Um, and during that period, while um, business was brisk, um, a new railway line was constructed into the docks uh, through the centre between the, if you remember back to the the, um, the map of the East India docks with the export dock and the import dock, and a, a new railway line was brought in um, from, in fact, those those blue lines, I think, were probably the railway lines. Uh, a new railway line was brought in um, through the centre of the, the, the docks um, as a branch line from, from Poplar. And since you have mentioned this now, uh, perhaps we can now come to uh, Dr. Muhammad Akhmagdullah because you mentioned Jude, uh, Peter, and, and uh, Muhammad, I know you you wanted to speak to us because, for example, I wasn't, I haven't, I had not made the connection of how important it was. So it's very good that we have you here tonight uh, to talk about us. Uh, what could you tell us about the role of Jude as a carrier of British imperial trade across the world? Okay, you know, jute um, um, originally it was uh, only or mostly produced in Bengal, right? It wasn't a huge uh, um, item that were used, uh, you know, for for um, trade, you know, in, in the past. Uh, but it was there, you know, people localized production and people used for different purposes, mm -hmm. um, including in you know, the rope making and uh, even poor people's clothes. Um, but I believe, you know, uh, sometime in the later part of the 18th century, the British East India Company started to make use of jute uh, as package materials because those days, you know, jute uh, were produced um, by hand looms. Um, and from 1800 onwards, uh, the use of jute increased, you know, in, in trade. Uh, but then they were still produced uh, 
by hand. And the East India Company did sell some samples, you know, to uh, to Britain to see if this material could become another important commodity, you know. But uh, um, nothing actually happened until Dundee, you know, managed to uh, produce a uh, um, machine-made urn from wool uh, by some process of using or combining with uh, whale oil. Uh, and then after Dundee managed to produce um, you know, urn and then textiles from jute, then jute slowly started to become a very important uh, carrier um, material for British uh, goods. So if you look at uh, you know the British trade and British expansion and increase in colonies, right? Yeah? And by about middle of 1800, 1900, Britain became the workshop you know, of the world and became the most powerful country and had the biggest trade and had the biggest share of uh, you know world trade and all the goods you know most of the goods not all the goods some were actually transported by boxes the wooden boxes and and maybe uh, other 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 materials the bulk of the goods you know the food the raw materials uh, the minerals and everything were imported uh, so they moved around using jute sacks and jute bags right now so the most of the production um, at first is to take place, you know, the machine made in Dundee. But then Calcutta also um, went into but Western people, British people, Scottish people, uh, you know, um, investing in Calcutta and producing uh, the textile, the urn there as well. Uh, in terms of uh, docks, right, um, is that uh, in, the, in the docklands, a um, lot of raw jute used to come. But a lot of raw jute used to also be directly shipped to um, Dundee, you know, from uh, Calcutta and some from Chiragan. Um, so docks, uh, East London docks, uh, for me, is very important for another reason, is that, um, you know, all the other goods, you know, that came and went uh, were, um, you know, facilitated by jute in terms of, you know, carrying, being the carry, carrying uh, sort of material. Uh, a, a carrier, right? So sugar coming from West Indies, you know, cotton coming from uh, Australia, um, cotton coming from America, sorry, um, yeah, Brazilian coffee, Caribbean sugar, Australian wool, not Australian cotton, sorry, and Australian corn, Egyptian um, grain, Cuban sugar, Brazilian nitrate. So many items, right, came to this country and then uh, the British fleets also carried, you know, a lot of these items. And sometimes, you know, some of the uh, manufactured textiles, two textiles in Dundee, were sent by train, you know, to London and then exported to uh, many parts of the world. The so Docklands pl played a role. And I have seen, um, you know, on um, some um, uh, sources uh, about some warehouse, you know, that were established in, in the Docklands. Um, in, in East India docks. And there were also some uh, warehouses, jute warehouses um, around in, in other parts of nearby areas in Sadak and, and also in West India docks and in Mill Hill area. Um, so jute was a really big, you know, very important um, in a material, a fabric that plays such an important role in the British uh, overseas expansion and carrying goods from all over the world from one place to another. And because the materials came from Bengal. Although at the moment, Bengal is not the biggest, uh, Bangladesh is not the biggest, you know, producer of uh, jute. India has become biggest, but they also produce in other places. I was surprised to learn that at one time, Brazil also became self-sufficient in, you know, the producing, manufacturing jute, right, yeah, from uh, cultivation uh, and so on, you know, which were actually facilitated by Japanese immigrants, you know, who helped develop a, particular uh, variety that grew in some regions in, in Brazil. So, and being from Bangladesh, right, and knowing that uh, a material, right, plays such a big role uh, around the world. But it's not only, you know, the jute sacks and, uh, you know, jute bags, right, and ropes. Uh, there are many other kind of items. What I learned recently was very kind of fascinating uh, that, you know, when there was a gold rush in, in Australia, and Australia is hot, hot country, and in some places during the gold rush, you know, when the desert, very hot places, they actually use jute to create some kind of uh, 
basic fridge, you know, right? Whereby jute helped uh, um, transfer the heat, you know, from inside this kind of fridge like uh, box, uh, metallic box, which had water surrounding it and jute uh, clothes around it. And then there was a mechanism by which water could seep into the um, into the jute material and then got evaporated by the wind. And through this mechanism, you know, the heat kind of went. So, um, and we're actually at the moment developing a project uh, on jute for East London, for Tower Hamlet. It's such an important fabric and and not many of us know, we still use it, you know, the bags and bags so comes in, uh, we used to get a lot of rice, you know, in, even until recently uh, in jute bags in, the, in this country. But now jute is becoming, you know, more fashionable now and, and more uh, kind of in demand because of the climate change thing. So even in Asda and places like Hugo, in Morriston, you can see jute bags and in charity shops in many places, um, you know, jute is becoming kind of uh, very important. So uh, Docklands played a role in carrying, you know, goods, uh, transporting, you know, exporting and importing goods using jute bags. Also some raw jute, I don't know the quantity, but near Docklands, East London Docks, you know, the, the, um, there was a factory, a jute factory established in Tarpenters Road in 1864. There was another one in Barking and the same guy, Richie, his own company set up another one in also Kenningtown, and they were en in Enfield, another jute uh, factory. There might be, might have been more, but I haven't had the chance, you know, to look into um, to to see the, you know, to what, what extent, how how much manufacturing of jute took place in various places of London. Uh, but it's not sort of fascinating to know that there were factories and jute factory established in Stratford. It was uh, because you know the raw jute was coming. To adopt and you were quite, you know, near. It's fascinating because I had never like joined the dots and to realize how important only one material was mm. in the whole history of the port of London. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Uh, Georgie, we kind of moved on, but we we promised that we would go back to talking about more about the uh, uh, South Asian seafarers and you for example sent me uh i think you sent me this uh this photo this map uh, what could you tell us about this image in relation to the story of the south asian seafarers yeah well i really just included this because that yeah thanks marietta um because there's it, it's very hard to get the figures and the statistics because because they were such an invisible labor force um but there's a couple of sources that we're able to look at. Um, one is Rosina Visram's work, and the other, this, this map is from um, the book called Counterflows to Colonialism by Michael Fisher. And what it, what it shows is um, a record on a ship um, that was, um, came to London, came to England in 1818, where there was actually an attempt to record the origins of the people who were working on that particular ship. So on this, it shows, um, you can see at the bottom, it says self-reported origins of the Sarang Tindal. They were like the um, bosun on the ships. They would they would recruit um, the Lashkars. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the O's. And then the L's are the Lashkars. And then the ship serpents and the sepoys were the the S, but just focusing on the 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 L's and the O's. If we look at this map, we can see that many many of them are coming from an area which does pretty much equate to present day Silet in Bang in northeast Bangladesh, which is um, where uh, the great majority of Bangladeshi British people originate from and also a little bit lower down it's kind of it's I can't it's difficult for me to point it out but it's at the top of the Bengal um, where where you see O and four L's and then under that three L's and an S which could could be around the port of um, Chittagong so uh, and then you can see all around the coast of India and then um, moving up as well to Oman and possibly, I don't know, the island there, it's a bit high to be Mauritius, but possibly it 
might have been meant to be Mauritius. So it's given, and and also as uh, Amadula was saying, um, further down in more in present day um, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia as well. So it it's a, a pretty good indication that agrees with other records of where men were being recruited from to work on ships at, at that time. So that's that's from 1818. But in terms of, um, you know, over time, people came from different areas. So, um, for example, Asif Shakur's family are from Punjab and many, many people came from that, that part of present day um, Pakistan. In terms of numbers, it's, again, really hard. Um, there is some record um, during 1813 of 1,336 South Asian seafarers coming coming into England at that time. Um, by the um, way, for those who don't know Asif, uh, he's the, the gentleman on a stage with uh, Dr. Jordi here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was interviewing him that time. Um, and in 1821 to 23, there were seven of seven ships that came in actually had 84% um, of their crews were Lashka crews. Um, so, so there were men coming in, but the trajectory is without, I haven't got any tables to show you now, is that, um, uh, you know, it was sort of between one and 2000 men who were coming in until the introduction of steamships and the opening of the Suez Canal. Um, sort of after the mid part of the um, 19th century. And that's when we really saw an increase uh, in the numbers of South Asian seafarers working on, working on um, British ships. Um, so that um, I'm going a bit beyond, but just to give an idea that by the Second World War, 25% um, of the crews working on British, in the British Merchant Navy were South Asian seafarers, and that is a really hidden history. But um, they had a they played a really really important role in both world wars, which I'm sure you're going to have another discussion on um, another day. I was going to say I I can see we should be like wrapping up in five to ten minutes, and and there's still so many things we haven't talked about because there are so many things to talk about. Um, when we talk about the history of the East India dog. So apologize. I do apologize that we won't be able to cover everything, but I I think we've tried to cover as much as possible. And we could be doing like only five more events only to talk about the East India dogs. Uh, I'm I'm gonna very quickly uh, perhaps uh mention a couple of things more before um we close uh today's event. For example, we had a part of this building which we uh, in my script we were going to talk about a bit later uh, but then because it was referenced we brought it early we put it on the screen a bit earlier but uh, could you have georgie or peter just briefly explain what this building is and the importance of it peter do you want to do that <laughs> well, okay <laughs> so it's east india house in um, in the city of london um and um, so, you know, the East India Company, uh, initially, it, it started very small. So it started in the home of the, the chairman in the, in the very early days. Then they, they, um, they, their, their offices got bigger and grander until they ended up with this, this huge building, which was, um, um, as I said earlier, you know, they, they, they ruled India they, uh, from this building. But the, the, the important thing from a uh, trade point of view was that uh, you had all these, um, these men working in this building um, which were called writers they, they, they called them writers and these men were the men who communicated you know if you go back to the days before telephones and email um, everything had to be done <laughs> on paper um, and uh, to uh, so if they wanted to send a, a letter to um, to say um, Calcutta and say okay we want this kind of silk on your on your next journey um, so can you, you know, if they sent that, you know, letter to the, their agent in uh, in Calcutta saying, you know, please gather together this kind of silk, um, it would take a few months before from the time that they wrote that letter out to to India, um, and and then um, then the reply saying, oh sorry, we couldn't get that kind of silk, would take a few <laughs> months to come back again. Um, so they had these writers who were very skilled in writing in particular ways to 
make sure because you know you know how you if you can write an email today and you, you write it very <laughs> casually and then the person at the other end doesn't really understand what you're talking about and so you have to rewrite it well you know if it's taking uh you know best part of a year to go there and back you know you can't really do that so these guys were very skilled in writing a particular way and and they actually became the basis of the british um civil service the, the civil wow. service the british government took over uh working in the same ways that were created by the east india company in this building um and the building was big enough that they even had a museum in there so they were collecting um uh different um, ca- um items of interest from from the from the far east um which they they uh, they had within this this building uh so it must have been a very interesting building i can't remember when it was demolished but uh, sadly it no longer exists i i was just I was going to say fascinated, perhaps more shocked, is uh, the realization of what you mentioned, uh, uh, Georgie, you mentioned that, Peter, as well, that territories, land far away, were ruled by people in this building. How shocking. And, and now when we think about it, how unfair it was. But it's, uh, yeah, that's why it's so important that we learn from our history and reflect on what, reflect on what was happened and what was fair and not and not as fair um very quickly uh because because i had this beautiful photo that uh the amazing team from the thames festival trust uh supplied to me for tonight uh the catty shark uh is the catty shark history connected to the east india dogs i'm asking from a point of total ignorance um i don't i don't think it was directly um i mean only well, I'm, I'm not really sure about this. Maybe others know, but uh, I think only indirectly in that the Katisak, of course, was was a, a class of boat, class of ship that was made to be very, very fast so that it could bring tea back to um, from China, I think, to Britain um, as fast as possible. So in that sense, I think there's a connection. Um, but I don't think it's directly connected to the um, East India docks. It might be. I don't know. And we have a comment from lovely Susan who says Joyce, Joyce of London was built on the original site of East India House that we were talking about just a moment ago. So, uh, Susan, thank you very much for uh, for letting for, well, for telling us. I didn't know that. So thank you very much for your contribution uh, about this topic that we were just uh, discussing, uh, this beautiful building. Uh, let me change the comment because I just wanted to say that Robert uh, has another connection with uh, the church we were talking about earlier. Mum and dad were also married at St. Uh, Matthias. How do you pronounce? Because I thought I thought it's Matthias in Matthias or Matthias, depending on the accent in Spanish. Matthias. And, Ma- and Matthew in English. So I was very shocked that, to see Matthias spelled as in Spanish, but in English, because I would have thought it's Matthew in English. In English. I think they call it Matthias. <laughs> That's how they pronounce it. And and Jennifer has added about the Catisark yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that we were talking about that it's a, a tea clipper. And uh, Georgia, I don't know if you want to add anything else about the Cutty Shark. About the Cutty Shark? Um, not really about the Cutty Shark. I was really, I was just going to say about St Matthias Church that if you do get down there, it's really worth going when it's open, and um, you can look inside, and there's kind of various plaques that memorialise people who were captains in the East India Company, and also some of the graves um, outside, which have got um, ships on them. Um, and the people people who work there know a lot about the history um, of the church. So yeah, if you're if you're passing by, do do pop in. And and thank you as well um, for the comment about the Lloyds of London. It's it's if if people don't know what the Lloyds of London building looks like, it's the Richard Rogers shiny oh. aluminium building with the pipes on the outside. And um, it is worth um, going and having a look at it and look thinking of it in relate <laughs> in relation to the Cutlers. Um, gardens office complex which was the, the the warehouses just wandering around there and you know working out the geography of you know, how, how, how they meet up with the commercial road and then and then extend to the east india dot road and the old entrance to the docks i'm gonna go like really quick what i'm going what i'm doing now is rather than going through my original script and through the questions that we had left i'm just showing the photos that i had i hadn't <laughs> I haven't had the time to show yet and see if we can say something, even if it's very briefly about these photos that we had prepared for tonight. Uh, we talked about 
we act, no, we actually have not talked about uh, working conditions of the dockers in uh, in uh, in the Isle of Dogs, in particular in East India and West India Dogs that we were talking about, uh, and how that might have led to this big event, the big strike. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you could tell us something very quickly about the big strike. Yeah, I, I don't know if so. Okay, the. Um, I think you're referring to the Great Strike of uh, of 1889. Um, yeah, correct. I, I don't know if that the photo is. Strike, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that photo is from that that particular strike. But uh, what happened was that there was um, um, a, a dispute that happened in the in the West India docks. Uh, so this is after the West India docks and East India docks were, were one company. The, there was a dispute in the West India docks um, over the unloading of a ship, and this was in the very very early days of. Um, uh, of trade unions, uh, they were just forming, and so they've been the the uh, match goals strike at the um, at the Bryant and May factory um, in the East End. Um, there was a strike at the Beckton Gas Works, um, and then then there's this, this dispute about the unloading of a ship in the West Indies docks, and that escalated. Um, so. Um, Within a day or two, um, all the dockers had worked. All the dockers that the West India docks had walked out. The then it spread to the East India docks, um, and then within a week or so, um, all of the all of the dock, all the dockers in the whole port of London had walked out. And it was estimated that there were seventy thousand, seven zero, seventy thousand dockers that came out on strike. Uh, in that strike um, and uh, there were great marches um, from the East End every day into the into the city of London to the um, the offices of the the dock companies and um, for, but so these dockers you know organized these big marches of uh, 10,000 men each day coming into the city and um, so this strike went on for for weeks for uh, about four or five weeks and then um, the um, Cardinal Manning, who was this very old, very elderly um, um, Catholic um, Archbishop of Westminster, um, and he got involved um, because he had got connections with the East End because um, a lot of the dockers were, were actually um, of Irish descent and were Catholics. And so he got involved and he became the mediator that eventually ended the strike. Uh, there was a... Um, the, what the, the stockers were striking for was six pence per day in in, in wages, um, and which was called the Dockers Tanner. And so um, the Dockers eventually got their Dockers Tanner uh, at the end of the strike. Um, so that's that's the about the, the Great Strike, which I guess is is um, from. So you, you could see in that uh, in that picture, by the way, the, the the dock gates were closed, and that they were closed because the strike was was going on. Yeah, actually, yep. yeah, you can. Yep. That's what I liked about this photo and what I wanted to show it, even if, if briefly, because we have always seen this iconic image of this gate, and and the the gate is always open, and and you can see that the gate is closed, on, in this photo. Uh, another photo I didn't get to show when uh, when Peter when you were talking about the import when about when the East India docks were built and then the merger with with West India Docks and how big they were at the time. And I had this beautiful photo that I think I received yeah. both from you and also from James and the Thames Festival yeah. Trust team. Yeah, so um, in the in the latter part of the 19th century, um, there were two companies who were the main, two shipping companies who were the main users of the East India Docks. Uh, one was Union Castle, which you see there. Um, there they, they were long distance steamers um, who mainly traded with Africa, South Africa and other um, places um, in that direction. Um, and they were so the East India Dock became their, their base in, in London. Um, there was another company which I forget the name. I think it was called something like Aberdeen Liners or Aberdeen uh, something like that. Uh, and they were the other main user of the, the East India Docks. So that's that's a great photo. And we get to the end of the journey. Why did the docks close? Yeah, well, OK, so vessels were um, that were coming to the Thames were getting larger. And so they were having trouble getting to the, the older docks, the older upriver docks, the East India, the West India um, and the London docks. And so they were beginning to to move down river to the Royal Docks and Tilbury. Um, and so the the older docks were going gradually going out of use. 
Um, then in the Second World War, the East India export dock was badly damaged. And after the war, it never reopened. Um, it was, um, and during 1946, it was filled in. And between 1947 and 1956, in, in uh, the Brunswick power station was, was that we go back to that name, Brunswick, the Br Brunswick power station was, was built over it. Um, but the import dock still continued for a while, um, and it handled uh, sea, uh, short sea and coastal traffic, uh, in other words, smaller ships. Um, and in the 1960s was being used by the Fred Olsen line, um, and they were they were they specialised in um, fruit and vegetable coming from the Canary Islands. Um, but nevertheless, there was a surplus of capacity in the old docks, and so it made sense for the, the the Port of London Authority to close down any underused docks to save on main, maintenance and sell off the land. Um, and the gate, the main gateway we've been seeing there at the East India Docks was was finally demolished in 1958 to make way for the new approach to the Blackwall Tunnel. Um, and the import dock eventually closed in 1967 and was filled in. Um, and um, and then um, if you if people remember a few years back, um, the um, there was um, at the entrance to the um, Blackwall Tunnel, there was a big building, a big modern building, uh, which was the Financial Times building at that time. And that was built um, on uh, the site of the, the um, East India import dock. Um, and that later, it's no longer the Financial Times building, but it became a, a British telecom building after that. Um, so um, as that photo indicates, there, there are still parts of the East India. So there's not much to see these days, but the, yes. there are parts that still survive. Um, so um, the main part, uh, which can still be seen, is very nice. It's the old entrance basin. There it is. Um, and um, it's now kind of like a big pond, really. Um, but it's um, it's really a, a nature reserve, which is part of the um, uh, the Lee Valley Park, and it has several grade two listed um, uh, parts to it. You can see over on the right hand side of the picture, you can see some old walls there um, of the docks. Um, so that's the, probably the sort of the, the biggest thing to see. But around the the area around there, in the streets around, um, there are still some features that still exist. So there's various walls and there's gates. Um, and um, one of the nicest is the um, uh, the gate of the East India Company's pepper warehouse, um, which yes, there it is on the, um, the left hand side of the screen. And there's there's some old walls in uh, um, uh, of the old um, East India docks. And um, I think you may have a picture of there's a low, large stone plaque uh, at the entrance to the Blackwall Cut Tunnel. Mm -hmm. I don't, I that don't have it uploaded to the studio, but oh, okay, I can okay. ping it as a comment at the end of the right. session. Okay. So yeah, if um, <laughs> most people they drive straight into the Blackwall Tunnel, but if you were to walk <laughs> there and, and stop there, um, you'd see that there's a big um, stone uh, commemoration, which was the actually the from above the um, the, the gate of the the old East India Docks, uh, and it was preserved and is now there, standing there at the, the entrance to the Blackwall Tunnel. But otherwise, there's um, oh yes, you can. Uh, if you see at the clock tower, the clock tower of uh, yeah. the gate, and then that sort of uh, square below it, that's the um, that's what's preserved and beside the um, uh, the Blackwall Tunnel entrance. But otherwise, more, most things have gone and uh, um, and have been rebuilt, have been built over, and uh, are now sort of modern housing or warehouses or factories or offices and so on. So I, there I, are. So I, this. And our friend yeah. Robert Rogers also contributed, uh, wanted to contribute to this uh, last part of the event. And he says the old entrance, and I think he's talking about when we were discussing how this looked like the entrance to the Blackwell Tunnel, Black Tunnel. And he said the old entrance vanished in the 60s before the new entrance to the new tunnel was constructed. And the road to the tunnel now goes under the road, as uh, you can see in the picture. Um, uh, apologies for two things that uh, we have um we got to the end of the uh of the show and there's still so many things we wanted to talk about and we couldn't the other thing i apologize about is i thought my cat was not in the room uh because he man he always hides very well i thought he was out and he is here uh so he has now joined us live and he's telling me that it's time to go for dinner it is so so just before we leave uh Peter, thank you very much. I think you have uh, taken us to the finish line. But Georgi or Muhammad, any final comments, any final thoughts before, uh, yes, we uh, wrap up for dinner? 
No, it's, uh, it's been fascinating, new perspective. Peter has got a lot of knowledge, gained a lot of uh, deeper understanding of, uh, of uh, you know, history of the area. Um, and uh, uh, so when we go for walk with Georgie next time, because I have a <laughs> with Georgie, <laughs> we have new things to tell people. And just a little bit about the Cutlass House, uh, uh, you know, the warehouse, Cutlass Street warehouse. Uh, we used to uh, do a lot of uh, walks with Nick Robbins. I don't know if people know Nick Robbins. Uh, well, he he made a he made a, a very interesting book, wrote a very interesting mm -hmm. book about the East India Company, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And he has been helping us uh, run East India Company walks, especially covering you know City of London and uh, Liverpool Street, that sort of area. And he took us to uh, Cutler Street warehouse uh, so many times. There used to be a plug there, but that's gone missing now. I've got pictures of the plug, which used to be outside, you know, with uh, um, saying that, you know, all the different kind of imports that used to come. It's quite nice looking, but that's no longer there. Thank you very much. Uh, Georgie, any final thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to say something about the developments that are going on around the spaces and how um, there's very little incorporated into any of those developments which remember any of the histories um, that we've been talking about. And maybe that also links to the first question about the, the future of the docks as well. Um, I think that the Lee, uh, Lee, Lee River <laughs> Trust, uh, Valley Trust, are going to put in some sort of regeneration bid in which it might be possible to have a little bit more history writing around the docks so so people know more about what they are and why they're there so I, I really hope that that's going to happen um and that you know they just become much more visible in to to not, not just you know people who are super interested like all of us but um people generally living in the area or visiting I have to something to watch of course, quickly, yeah. Right, yeah? now george you're talking about uh you know, writing um, about missing history. And what we found quite like a bit offensive and a bit sad as well, you know, when you go past, you see Virginia Monument and there's no mention of the Native Americans, what happened to them, right? They celebrate, you know, these people going there, a nice monument. But what, and that led to the genocide and total near annihilation of uh, the population of North America. There's no mention. That should be there, you know, the consequences of, you know, those first settlements, what happened to the Native Americans, Native uh, populations. I think that's, you know, that's a very important point. Yeah, because we haven't talked about the Virginia mm -hmm. uh, uh, monument, because uh, as I said, there's so many things that we could have touched on talking about the East India dogs, and we just didn't have the time, but, but that's, yeah. Uh, actually, I had I I I knew, I knew about the Virginia Monument, and I had never thought of it from that perspective. So I really thank you, uh, Muhammad, because those are the things that we need to, yeah, we need to open our mind and 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 and, and look at the other stories and and give voice to the give give voice to the people whose stories never were never told. And I think, uh, Georgie, you have also been doing a lot of work mm -hmm. for that. So thank you. So thank you. Thank, thank you to the three of you for being with us this evening and thank you to everybody who has tuned in to watch live and who have participated with comments. Uh, I'm very happy to see that people like, for example, uh, see if we can, I can quickly find Lorraine from the Royal Docks History Club has also joined us this evening. Uh, Susan, thank you very, very much. She says, I have learned so much more about our wonderful city of London and the docks areas. Well, that's what that's this is what we intended to do this evening. And apologize to Anna that I might have not been able to answer her question, but I keep putting it on a screen because I do have so much respect for the communities in the Docklands who have suffered so much through their regeneration process and after the closure of the dock. So even if that was not what we were tackling this evening, I do have a lot of respect for how challenging the situation has and continues to be for a lot of people in uh, London Docklands. I think it's time that we um, call it a day and that I go and feed my cat and I, probably you haven't had a chance to eat either. So I'm going to leave you to enjoy the, breeze, the rest of the evening. And of course, thank you so very much to Thames Festival Trust for bringing us thank together you. this evening. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.